Hey guys, David Robinson here. Welcome to the Apartment Investing Journey. Uh, as usual, we've got another great guest for you today uh, with a great background and uh, I think an intriguing story uh, that you will all have an opportunity to learn from today. I've got Clive Davis with me today. Clive, welcome to the show. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, David. Really happy to be on with you. So Clive is a recovering corporate transactional lawyer. Love that. And uh, a compliance professional who left a 20-year corporate career five years ago to delve full-time into multifamily real estate investing. He's passionate about building generational wealth and helping others to do the same to help increase the number of African Americans investing in multifamily uh, in the multifamily investing space, he created and hosts on Facebook the African American Multifamily Investor Network, which currently has about 1,100 members. So, congratulations on building up a great network uh, where you can really serve a lot of people. Uh, Clive, that's just a, a very brief bio. Obviously, you have uh, a, a background as an attorney in, in a uh, professional space. Um, our podcast is all about the journey, so we would love to back up and hear a little bit about your background and your backstory and how you got started in the real estate world. Sure. So the, the backstory is uh, a, a kid with humble beginnings. Um, I'm, I was actually born in London in the UK, and uh, we uh, relocated to the US in the mid 80s and settled on the Jersey Shore in New Jersey. And uh, so that's where I did most of my school in high school on and um, uh, through law school. And uh, I started out, uh, as you mentioned or referred to earlier, as a corporate transactional lawyer servicing Wall Street uh, clients and, and, and firms and, and by extension, the companies that they service and uh, did that for a number of years and um, ultimately moved on to become in-house counsel with Pfizer. Um, who's uh, been in the news as of late for, for all of the right reasons. And um, I worked with them for about six years. They actually ended up relocating me to Atlanta, which has been my home for the last 16 years. And um, uh, my final corporate role before leaving the corporate world at the end of 2016 was as a chief compliance officer for a Belgian biopharma. So all in all, a 20 year corporate run and throughout that entire time period, uh, starting with my first investment in 1999, I invested in a uh, duplex uh, property down in Florida, Southwest Florida, and held that up until uh, about 2018. So definitely a long term hold. So over that 20 year period, I've owned duplexes, I've owned single units. Um, and uh, in 2007, I, I acquired a five unit, which was my first technically commercial uh, property. And we sold that uh, uh, two weeks into COVID in 2020. Um, so, it's over, so over that 20 year period, owned mostly small and single unit, small multifamilies. And then in the last few years, I've really focused and drilled down on large scale multifamily, which is what I'm doing full time today. Love it. That's a great uh, overview of uh, the last uh, 25 years or so. Um, I want to dive into a few pieces of that. The first is in regard to that very first investment property. Um, here you are, from what I understand, either you were in New Jersey or Atlanta at that point in time. And in, well, you were in Atlanta at that point in time. I in New York, actually. Oh, really? Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so in working in New York and acquired that duplex in Florida. Uh, like I said, in 1999. So I was self-managing it from a distance, uh, okay. so to speak. Um, I, and the reason I ended up investing in that location, there was no strategy in it. My parents had retired to that community in 1996. Mm. And so for me, um, I'd always wanted to have some exposure to real estate. It was something I was comfortable with. Um, and the way I set it up is I acquired it I opened up a bank account. I put my name and my parents' name on the account. And so instead of giving them an allowance, I effectively said, look, you don't need to ask me for money. There's an account there. Uh, rent checks would go and get deposited into it. And so they would have access to funds as needed. 
Um, and they were also able to, you know, if I needed kind of a, a boots on the ground or referrals or what have you, I, I could, at that point in time, I could kind of leverage them being there in close mm. proximity to the property. So that was the very first one. And you mentioned that you had always wanted to own real estate. Where did that come from? Did you have anybody in your life that had owned real estate, that had had rental properties? Uh, was it just uh, you know, innate in you to, to want to own real estate? What, what caused uh, you, know, you to always have that desire to own real estate? Yeah, so I, I would say that probably comes from my mother. Um, if I were, were to attribute it to one of my parents, it would be to my mother. So. When we uh, relocated to the U.S., uh, my mother had kind of arrived in the U.S. ahead of us and then the family followed. Um, but my mother, with her maybe fourth or fifth grade education, which is as much as she was able to attain formally, when we arrived, uh, she had a single family residence that we moved into. And then she also had a rental property in Queens, New York. Mm -hmm. And so she had done all of this, um, you know, through, you know, real blood, sweat, and tears, and, and 16 hour shifts, and, and, and multiple jobs. And so, so I saw that that was something that my father and I would drive up from New Jersey to Queens on the weekends, we'd be doing wallpaper and painting a uh, little handyman stuff. And I would tag along with my father as a 12, 13, 14 year old at the time. So, so that was my first exposure to tenants and tenants not paying and all kinds of issues. And yeah, I guess uh, it got started there. And so then I assume that, uh, you know, you're really going headlong into your corporate career um, and your law practice and investing excess income on the side. So here you are running in tandem as an investor and a, a you know, a, a professional in a high demand environment. Um, what was that experience like for you owning small multi and residential property, uh, single family residential, while managing a high demand career? Yeah, so I, I tried to, um, I, I would say that I, I definitely was not as disciplined with it and, and didn't necessarily treat it as a business as I should have been treating it um, for, for much of that time. Uh, I would say a lot of it was on autopilot. Uh, there were probably opportunities that I didn't seize um, I probably wasn't as disciplined about keeping pace with market rents and, and kind of surveying what's going on in the market and things of that nature. It was never kind of, it, it was passive income, but it was never passive income that I was reliant upon. Um, and so because of that, I probably, like I said, wasn't as disciplined as I needed to be. But very early on, I, I, I thought that self-managing was very um, doable. And um, as long as you had in your Rolodex, uh, folks don't have Rolodex now, but uh, as long as you had in your Rolodex an electrician, a plumber, a handyman that you could call out to the property as needed, I always felt that, you know, there was no need for me to be in the community or there. Um, and then uh, when there was something, maybe there was a change of tenants or what have you, I could always ask. Um, a family member um, to um, do what was needed on the ground to kind of get the get the unit re-rented and what have you. At one point in time, I had a brother that was living in one of the duplex units. Gotcha. And so um, let's fast forward then. Um, you spent, you know, 20 years in your corporate career and investing in, you know, uh, small multifamily you did mention acquiring eventually a, a five-plex, so your first foray into you know, the technically you know, commercial space. But uh, then a few years ago, you really decided to dive into this world of large commercial multifamily acquisitions. Tell us a little bit about what was going on in your world at that point in time from a professional standpoint, and what caused you to want to you know, uh, change course and, and get into the large commercial multifamily space. Yeah, so at the end of that 20-year run, end of 2016 and leading up to that time frame, 
Um, I, I was definitely working a lot. Uh, work was very demanding on my time. I, I would be in Brussels three or four times a year, Sao Paulo, Brazil, three or four times a year, same thing for Mexico City. So I had a good bit of international travel, which as you probably know, David, anytime you you, you fly across the Atlantic or, or, or make one of those international flights, that can be a, a week out of your, your life yeah. um, between the go-ins, the come-ins, the kind of get in um, just comfortable with the, the, the new environment and the time change and all of that. So, so that on top of my domestic travel and, and just the nature of the, the role that I was in, um, it was just very demanding on my time. I, I was not having the opportunity to see my parents um, as often as I would like to have, uh, maybe once or twice a year um, with the kids and, and myself. And so I wasn't happy with that. Um, so it's one thing to kind of play, play your position, play a role financially, but there's nothing like being able to just go visit and, and drop in when, when you want to drop in. And so my mother had been um, uh, largely bedridden for the better part of a year, bouncing between hospital, nursing home and home. And so, um, you know, I, I wanted to kind of uh, play more of a, a present role there. And so um, I just got to a point where I said, if not now, when am I going to scratch this entrepreneurial itch that I've had for, you know, the better part of that 20 year run, but, you know, failed to, to scratch. And, um, you know, at, the, at that point in time, I was probably about mid 40s and said, you know, if, if not now, when? Mm -hmm. And just decided uh, my oldest was going to be heading off to college in six months. I just said, let me bow out now. Um, I didn't have a, uh, you know, I didn't have my goals written out. I didn't have, you know, a strategic plan that I was following. Um, but I knew I had a little bit of a comfort zone where I could take some time and just devote to what do you want to do? So the first thing I did um, early into that period was to go buy the, the five unit again in the same community that my parents were in. And I figured if I do this, this is going to force me to be there because I'm going to need to be looking at properties, touring properties. When I finally get something, then I'm going to need to be renovating units, uh, dealing with tenants, blah, blah, blah. So it worked out exactly like that. I, I closed on something uh, in April of 17, and um, it resulted in me spending probably two weeks out of each month for about a six or seven month period um, before my mother ultimately passed. But the beautiful thing is um, that six or seven month window before she passed, I got to spend more time with her than I had in the six or seven years prior. So, mm. so you know, the, the planets aligned and, and things really worked out um, perfectly from that regard. And, um, and uh, you know, that five unit proof of concept turned out to be um, uh, a really good investment, uh, did really well. Um, and it was just confirmation for me that Clive, yeah, you can do this. And, um, you know, at a certain point I just said, okay, no more of the small stuff, you know, let's, let's think bigger. And, uh, along those lines, that's when I started focusing in on this thing called large scale multifamily and all that that entails and, and embarked on a journey of getting myself educated and putting myself in close proximity to individuals who were doing exactly what it is that, that I aspired to do. I started investing heavily in commercial real estate via a self-directed IRA that I had set up as part of this education and um, literally putting my, my money where my mouth was and also using it not just for kind of a return on investment, uh, which I certainly was seeking, but also as a way of, of getting educated on the larger type transactions that, again, I was aspiring to do. Love that. And so if we um, go to that point in time when you bought that five unit, um, you know, your previous experience had been in small multi and, and single family. What was it about wanting to go bigger that appealed to you? Was it simply you felt like that was the challenge? Did you feel like there was greater opportunity? Did you feel like there was greater potential for higher returns? In your mind, what was it that pulled you towards, you know, scaling up and, you know, having that proof of concept with the five unit and then going even bigger from there? 
Yeah, I think it was just the the, the power of scaling and, and knowing that it would it would just compress the timeline for me to get closer to my ultimate objectives. And so I could have gone from a five unit and then went and looked at a 12 unit and, and kind of did it more incrementally. Um, but um, I was also in a position where, and I told someone this the other day, this was a period of time when this was the first time in my adult life, going back to the age of 18, where I had more money going out the door than was coming in on a monthly <laughs> basis. So, so I was not comfortable with that and, and, and having that be my reality for, for <laughs> longer than I, I, I uh, wanted it to be. Um, if I could you know, dictate or control that. And so I knew the incremental wasn't gonna be able to course correct that, that dynamic. And so I wanted to go bigger. Um, I, I started listening to podcasts, um, attending real estate conferences. And you know, as you know, David, none of these conferences are talking about, here's how you go buy a, a two or three or four, uh, or even a five. You know, they're talking about you know, bigger scale and you know, once you start talking about syndication, syndication and that whole model really only works and is best suited to kind of larger scale acquisitions. Because if you're doing the smaller stuff, you can't necessarily justify the associated cost of doing a syndication and all of the formalities associated with that. So just naturally you start gravitating in that direction. And um, again, when I, when I think about what I was aspiring to do, and the investments that I was making passively, um, you know, everything was kind of gearing me up for, okay, you can do this at a bigger scale. And I, and I think my, my corporate, especially my corporate transactional background early on as a junior associate Wall Street firm, being exposed to big deals, um, mm. <laughs> not with my money involved, um, but, but client deals that are, you know, major players, major investment banks servicing Fortune 100 companies, you know, just the exposure to that kind of um, uh, puts you in a position where you're, you're thinking about what's possible. And, and so, you know, I kind of leveraged that memory um, and, and kind of that time period um, to kind of inform what it is that I wanted to do. So I, I wanted to go from incremental to, let's see how big I can go and what do I need to do to go that, that big. Love that. Um, so let's talk then about, well, two things that I wanna to touch on. Number one is, um, do you still own your small multi and single family or have you repositioned the equity that you've had in those into large commercial? What, what have you done with your portfolio? Yeah, so my portfolio, my personal portfolio is down to one uh, co-op unit in New York City now, which I've had since 97. And that's probably something that will be part of that generational wealth that I will pass down to the family and, and hopefully that will remain in the family. But I had uh, sold off the duplex in 2018. I sold off the five unit in uh, 2020, the first quarter. And, and part of that was, okay, if I'm going into this direction, let me kind of sell off, leverage the equity that I can pull out of the, these uh, deals that have done very well. Um, but when I do get into large scale multifamily, these will probably become more of a nuisance um, mm -hmm. competing for my time, then it's justifiable. So, so, you know, one, again, going back to that dynamic of first time since I was a, uh, an adult, having more money go out the house than coming in, um, I needed to also kind of fund my um, escape from corporate America. And so the, the small multifamily enabled me to kind of bridge that gap. And then ultimately when I, when I sold those properties, um, those lump sums were, a, were able to be available to me um, when I needed to put my own kind of skin into the game as I, I got my deals and, and, and um, moved in that direction. Love it. And so let's talk about that transition then, the first step into the commercial, uh, large scale commercial multifamily syndication space. How did you go about getting your first deal done? 
you know, everybody's story is a little bit unique on how they do it and what they focus on. I think everybody sort of alludes to the fact that this is a team sport when you once you start playing, you know, with these larger assets. <clears throat> I'm curious about your, you know, personal experience and, and how you, you know, put together your first deal. Um, yeah, so I'll just let you sort of uh, describe that for us. Sure. So uh, for me, uh, uh, my pathway was as part of that education. So, you know, you do a certain amount of podcast listening, you do a certain amount of conference attendance, all of that is good. And, and, and frankly, uh, I would still be doing that, you know, uh, but for COVID, um, you know, in person, I'd be doing that. So that education is ongoing. But for me, I was looking for how can I get in close proximity with people who are already doing what it is that I want to do. So for me, the answer was to join a multifamily mentoring group. So at the end of 2018, and I really effectively got started in early 19, I joined a group uh, that was set up exactly for that. So it was a group that was teaching and preaching the merits of investing in large-scale multifamily, syndicating. Um, and so all of the partners that I have today are individuals that I, I gained through that mentoring program. And, and so you're absolutely right. It is a team sport. So you've got your immediate kind of partners and co-sponsors that are part of the team. And then, as you know, the, the team is even bigger than that because you've got others who are, you know, at least I consider part of the team whether they be insurance brokers, tax consultants, uh, your lawyer, your legal advice. So all, all, of those, all of those players are part of the team in, in my view. Um, but uh, you know, the answer is really, for me, it was doing my due diligence, looking out there and seeing what was available in terms of education and mentoring programs, and then deciding on one. And um, you, know, you go through kind of that, that training uh, but the real value to me in 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 getting involved with a mentoring program was being around people who I didn't need to convince and don't need to convince about the merits of multifamily investment. They were already sold. So then it's just about them getting to know me and vice versa and, and them getting to a point where they know, like, and trust me. Um, and hopefully they're interested in the market that I'm I'm playing in. And then I've just got to bring them an opportunity that, that meets their individual criteria. And, and if it does, it does. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. Um, I'm here in Atlanta. Atlanta is a great multifamily market and it happens to be the market that I'm exclusively targeting right now. And so, um, you know, that's really how I got into it and, um, and uh, was able to move towards my first deal. So, um let's talk about what your business looks like today and what you're focused on. You already uh, mentioned that you're in the Atlanta market, uh, physically living in Atlanta, and you're focused on Atlanta, which is uh, a top market for multifamily right now. Um, what does your business look like today and what do you personally focus on inside of that business? Yeah. So uh, it's, um, the beautiful thing, first and foremost, is that my day is 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 determined by me. So there's, there's um, outside of my kids and my wife, there's no one telling me what my day is going to be or where I'm going to be. All of that is determined based upon what I need to do to advance, uh, you know, whatever I'm working on. So no two days are necessarily alike, and it depends on where you are in the deal cycle at any given point in time. So in November, we closed the deal. Um, and I think that same week, we were awarded another deal. Um, so depending on where I am at any given point in time, right now, literally today, I'm, I'm focused on, we're, we're actually engaged in capital raising. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm focused on due diligence and, and talking to insurance brokers and 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 lenders and things of that nature. And I'm kind of orchestrating the the day-to-day the -day, um, deal management, if you will, um, making sure that we are doing everything we need to do to get to the closing table uh, in a timely manner um, and uh, there'd be no surprises. So 
uh, again, reflecting back to my early days as a junior corporate transactional lawyer, I'm seeing that I'm, I'm leveraging a lot of that skill set in terms of, you know, when you're a junior associate with these, these large white shoe firms, you know, a lot of what you're doing and a lot of what you're able to do at that kind of early stage in your career is to be kind of the, the quarterback on a deal where you're kind of responsible for making sure all of the pieces come together and, um, you know, you get to the closing and the closing goes smoothly. So I'm leveraging that on a day-to-day -day basis, um, again, depending on where we are in a particular deal cycle. And from uh, just a business structure and organization perspective, do you, is your business uh, um, one where it's mainly you and you have a particular skill set that you're bringing to the table and then you uh, will bring in other partners that complement your skill set to work on one particular deal? Or do you have partners in your business where you're all going out uh, as a business entity and taking a deal down on your own? Yeah, so in terms of my business, my entity, it's essentially me. Uh, and then I've partnered up with other experienced syndicators um, who and none of them live in, in Georgia or Atlanta. Uh, they're in Texas, they're in, in California. Um, and, you know, they have deals elsewhere and they, they've been developing their business longer. So I'm the most junior in terms of tenure in large scale multifamily. Um, but because I'm here in Atlanta and this is the market that I'm fishing in, uh, the deal uh, that I've closed and that we will close uh, next month or there, there or so, those are deals that I've kind of been the point person. Mm. Uh, I've, I've found the deal. I've underwritten the deal. Uh, I've kind of gotten all of the third party inputs to inform our underwriting. Um, and so I've pulled them in and obviously everyone is playing the role of capital raiser. Um, sure. We don't, you know, when you pull together a team, at least my view is that I, I don't care how much you're able to raise, but everyone has a responsibility to contribute to that. Um, and so in terms of, um, you know, interactions with, with legal, uh, with the lender, I kind of run point on that. And I, I also coordinate between the partners. Um, and um, we really kind of, uh, you know, when it's cost segregation, someone focuses in on that and, and they're managing that piece. Um, you know, if it's if it's discussions with the lender and the lawyers, I, I take the lead on that. Um, you know, if it's investor relations and, and kind of the processes and systems, someone else is kind of focused on that. So uh, we, we basically offer up the best of ourselves to advance the deal, depending on what the needs of the deal are. Um, but there's no one person who's doing investor relations, one person who's, do, you know, we, we kind of figure out who's best positioned. And um, obviously you don't want too much of the load to fall on any one person. Sure. And so uh, you kind of uh, delegate accordingly. Yeah, makes a lot of sense. I appreciate you going into uh, some detail there. Um, and then as, as far as, you know, you personally are concerned, uh, you know, obviously right now you, you're probably up to your eyeballs in the deals that you are working on right now. But when you don't have an active deal going, uh, would you sp say that a, a significant amount of your time is, is focused on sourcing new deals in Atlanta? Is that, uh, you know, a, a focus of yours? Well, um, yeah, 2022 has just begun, and so we're, we're, we'll see what 2022 holds. Um, my, my personal goal is to do four deals in 2022, which is basically at a, a cadence of one a quarter. Um, and so we have one that will close in the, in the first quarter uh, that's already well underway. And so um, part of my year is obviously going to uh, need to be sourcing additional deals to, to meet that personal ob objective. Um, the other thing that I mentioned, uh, maybe I didn't mention, is kind of post-close, uh, because I'm boots on the ground, I, I take on a bigger portion of the asset management responsibilities. So um, again, the rest of the partners are, are in California or, or, or Texas. Um, so part of my day-to-day -day will be kind of that asset management, overseeing the third-party manager, property manager, um, coordinating with the general contractor around renovations and making sure everything's 
uh, uh, going according to plan. Uh, so outside of that, whatever free time uh, that I have will definitely be devoted to sourcing new deals and new opportunities to make sure that we have uh, things that are potentially coming through the pipeline and ultimately that we can get under contract and then ultimately close on. Yeah, love that. And so if we were to, you know, project out over the next few years, obviously you've already alluded to, you know, some goals for, for 2022, getting, you know, four deals done, one per quarter. Um, what do you see for your business in the future? Do you, are you of the mind that you like staying independent and partnering on a deal by deal basis with other quality operators? Uh, do you have any inclination to try to formalize uh, a, a little bit more, for lack of a better word, formal business structure with your partners? I'm just curious about sort of your perspective on moving forward. Yeah, I mean, I think I remain somewhat fluid and, and, and open in terms of uh, how that unfolds. As I think about what I want to do personally, um, I, I definitely envision that there will be kind of an expansion into the development side of things. Um, and I know one of my partners is, is, is a, an experienced developer now and, and has multiple projects that he's working on. So that's something that I may look to um, join him in, uh, informally join him in, in terms of expanding to Georgia and, and the Atlanta Metro. So I definitely see kind of development kind of growing to be a part of what I focus on in addition to kind of the, you know, existing multifamily ownership and operation. Um, so that's something that's exciting and on the horizon uh, down the line. Uh, in terms of my own personal business and entity and, and business, um, part of what I'll be doing this year is formalizing some systems and processes and putting some of that in place because up until this point, I've pretty much cheated and focused on get deals. That's the most important thing. And then, you know, you can play catch up in terms of putting in place the processes and the systems to, to make your business more optimal and, and grow and scale and all of that. Um, so I'll, I'll probably, I likely will be bringing on board, whether they be virtual assistants, um, whether it be an analyst at some point in time to help me with underwriting. I, I see those being kind of natural evolutions of my own personal business. In terms of whether or not I will formalize any partnership, um, that remains to be seen. Um, if that's what makes sense and, and we continue to, you know, I refer to these partnerships as marriages, right? Hmm. So you are effectively marrying someone for three to five years, depending on what your hold plan is uh, for, for any property you acquire. So um I actually, one of the benefits of it taking some time before I got that first deal is that. I had already cemented the relationships with at least one of my, my partners today where we were chasing deals for a good while before we got something. And so you really get to know kind of values and, and kind of work styles, workflows, communication, all of that. So, um, you know, for me, I, I, I did not and, and don't want to ever jump into a relationship with someone just, just for one transaction uh, without having that foundation in place. Um, so now that we have one and we'll, we'll uh, have more deals under our, our belt, we'll be in a position and I'll be in a position where I can assess uh, how is this working post-close? Because everyone gets excited, you know, the deal gets awarded, you race into the closing table and you finally close. Um, but uh, I'm only a few months in in terms of what does post-close look like? Mm -hmm. And um you know, I think once I have a little bit more of that experience post close under my belt, you know, then that will inform uh, whether or not remaining kind of a separate entity and partnering, you know, on a on deal by deal basis or formalizing an entity that, you know, will go after more properties in a, in a formal combined structure. You know, that that'll kind of become clearer is my hope down the line. Makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, Clive, I've, I've really enjoyed our conversation and getting to know you a little bit better and understanding more about your own personal journey into the space. Uh, I want to start winding down here and be respectful of your time. 
But I've got a few final questions for you. Um, the first is, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing right now in your business that we could all learn from? Biggest challenge, uh, if you'd asked me a couple months ago, I would have said it, it's, it's finding, and, and finding a deal. Um, I, I had been a, a, a bridesmaid runner-up many times in best and finals and, and gotten to the point of, uh, being in buyer interviews and then not quite getting uh, to the finish line. Um, we finally had that breakthrough and, and ended up closing on, on one deal. So, um, but one thing I know was true then and remains true now. And, and uh, you know, I'll have a better sense as to, you know, what things are looking like in 2022 over the next four weeks or so in terms of inventory and deal flow and what have you, but competition. Um, so, you know, I, I've offered on properties where there are, have been as many as 48 other offers. Mm. Um, and, um, you know, uh, there was a point in time where if you saw 20 or, or two dozen offers, you were like, wow, that's a lot. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I've doubled that now. So I, I think it's a challenge, but I think our recent wins are going to help us be more competitive than we were before we got that first deal and, and now a second deal um, because we're now starting to be more of a known entity in the marketplace. Um, and with two deals with two different brokerage firms that mm. now have been able to see us up close perform. Um, you know, I, I tell everyone that before you close your first deal, you're nothing more than a tire kicker. And, 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 and the brokers are, you know, car sales people, and they, they only want to spend their time with people who are actually buying cars. And so until you drive something off the lot and, they, and they're like, oh, man, that was Clive that just blazed out of here. They don't really take you seriously. So now I, I'd like to think that we're, we're taken more seriously. We, we've been able to demonstrate our ability to perform. And so competition isn't going away, but I think we we hopefully will fare better in the competition because we've proven ourselves to, to be a, a proven performer. What's something that you are just absolutely crushing right now, doing very well in your business that we could all learn from? Wow. Um, I, I, I think I'm always learning. Um, one of the things that I'm doing is, is networking. Um, so when I, throughout those 20 years of, of corporate life, I tell people that I did not have a healthy respect for networking because it was not critical to my role and the success in my role. Mm -hmm. um, and so I kind of boo-hooed it and was like, ah, oh, yeah, networking uh, and kind of dismissed it as, yeah, you go somewhere, you're uncomfortable for an hour or two and you hand out some business cards. Now I am very disciplined about my networking, refreshing and reestablishing connections that maybe had gone dormant over the years and the many moves and roles uh, that I've been in. Um, so I, I don't know that I'm doing it as systematically as I, I will be doing it going forward. Um, but I'm doing that better than I ever have. And, and I'm seeing that yield results in terms of obviously that's, you know, that's the lifeblood of, of capital raising is, is mm. effective networking. Um, but beyond even for the, the, the sole purpose of, of raising capital, because, you know, as you know, from when you're networking, it may be multiple deals before anyone gets to the point where they feel comfortable enough to actually pull the trigger and invest alongside you. Um, so I, I just think I'm, I'm really effectively networking and building connections that if they're not immediately uh, beneficial um, will prove to be beneficial down the line. And, and, and hopefully I'm, I'm uh, any of these relationships that I'm referring to, I also think that I'm bringing value to them. I'm, I'm passionate about real estate. I can talk about real estate. Um, and so um, there are a lot of folks who are further back in their journey than I am, and, and, I, and I take seriously being able to kind of reach out and share what I know and my experiences and hopefully benefit someone um, who, like I said, is further back in their journey than, than I am today. Love it. 
Well, Clive, this has been a great conversation. And I, I appreciate you spending some time with us and sharing your journey and some insights that you've gleaned uh, over this transition from your corporate career into the real estate space and uh, specifically uh, large commercial multifamily. Um, uh, the last question I've got for you is what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you and learn more about what you have going on and, and maybe even participate in one of your future opportunities? Sure. So I, I'm, I'm very active on LinkedIn. So you can find me uh, and I imagine you'll, you'll provide the link in the, the show notes, but I'm active on LinkedIn. I'm active on Facebook. Uh, you can reach me via email at Clive at parkroyalcapital.com. Um, and, and I readily give out my phone number uh, where you can text or call me, and that is 770-366-4093. I uh, pride myself on my responsiveness, and so generally if you reach out to me, uh, even if I can't uh, meet with you or talk with you uh, that day, usually you're going to get a response from me within a day, uh, maximum two days, uh, you'll hear from me. Great. And we'll have uh, a link to those contact points in the show notes. So if you've enjoyed our conversation with Clive today and you'd like to reach out to him and learn more about what he has going on, uh, go down into the show notes right now and click on one of those links. Clive, again, a, a, a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you for sharing your time and your journey with us. And we look forward to connecting with you again soon. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, David.